Good day. Welcome to Fresh Manna Midweek Moments, hosted by Rev. Dr. Alan G. Jenkins, Jr. and yours truly, Benjamina Jenkins, and a host of pastors, evangelists, teachers, ministers, prayer warriors, and partners. Together we are on a mission to encourage, equip, and strengthen the body of Christ and to win souls for the kingdom of heaven. God bless you and enjoy this message today. Good morning and welcome to Fresh Manor Ministries. I am your host LT for your Mid Manor Weekly Moment entitled A Lease Vineyard. A Lease Vineyard. You know, oftentimes you must be careful to who you lease your property to because it may not come back in the same condition when you leased it out. They say People don't always take care of things that are not theirs as well as the owner would because it is not theirs. Father in heaven, we thank you for this message entitled A Lease Vineyard, taking from Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. We ask that you would give us uh, insight into this message. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You know, sometimes tenants don't respect other people's property. Often, it is not easy to get them out when the lease is up or there may be holes in the walls or in the doors. The floors sometimes are left destroyed. The plumbing problems can be costly. There may be a host of other unforeseen problems which the owner did not expect to incur. This seems to be the case in the parable of the vineyard in Mark chapter 12 verses 1 through 12 where we find tenants wanted to usurp the vineyard for themselves from the rightful owner. It is a parable, nonetheless, with real implications attached to it, as we shall later explore. The interesting thing about a parable is a story thrown alongside to reveal a truth. Here we read in the New English Translation, beginning in verse 1, of chapter 12 in Mark's gospel. It reads in this fashion. Then Jesus began to speak to them in parables. We'll stop there and wonder why Mark tells us then it began. Jesus began to speak to them in parables. The Greek word chi has been translated then and not and. To distinguish between the events that occurred previously and to link them up to what's going to happen in the next section of Mark's Gospel in chapter 12. As we look back into chapter 11, and we wonder why Mark says, then he began to speak to them in parables. We read here in verse 27 of chapter 11, it says, they came again to Jerusalem, they being the disciples and Jesus. Um, they earlier had been in the city previously. It says in, I believe it's around um, Mark 15. Or we could go, yeah, Mark 15. Then they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus entered into the temple area and began to drive out those who were selling and buying in the temple courts. He turned over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. Then he began to teach them and said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Verse 18 says the chief priests and the experts in the law heard it, and they considered how they could assassinate him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed by his teachings. It says when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. So therefore we see here in verse 27 that it says they came again to Jerusalem. While Jesus was walking in the temple court, the chief priests, the experts in the law, and the elders came up to him, meaning that they came up with the authority of the Sanhedrin court. They came up and they asked him this question, By what authority are you doing these things? Or 
who gave you this authority to do these things? Jesus said to them, and here is what Mark is trying to tell us, that Jesus is speaking plainly to them. But in the first verse of chapter 12, it says, Then he began to speak to them in parables. This causes you to look back at what has been previously stated. Jesus said here in verse 29 of Mark 11, Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. John's baptism, was it from heaven? or from people. Answer me. They discuss with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Then why did you not believe him? But if we say from people, and it's in parenthesis, they feared the crowd, for they all considered John to be truly a prophet. It's on parenthesis, verse 33. So they answered Jesus, We don't know. Then Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Here Mark tells us in the first verse of chapter 12, Then Jesus began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a fence around it. He dug a pit for his wine press and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenant farmers went on a journey. I am reading from the New English translation and it says in verse 2, at harvest time he sent a slave to the tenants to collect from them his portion of the crop. But those tenants seized his slave, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. So he sent another slave to them again. This one they struck on the head and treated outrageously. He sent another, and that one they killed. This happened to many others, some of whom were beaten, others killed. He had one left, his one dear son. Finally he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw his body out of the vineyard. Mark has asked the profound question to his readers, what then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. It says here in the 12th verse of Mark 12, now they wanted to arrest him again in parenthesis, but they feared the crowd, on parenthesis, because they realized that he told this parable against them. So they left him and went away. You see, uh, it is a parable nonetheless with real implications attached to it. And it says the interesting thing about a parable is a story that has been thrown alongside to reveal a truth. Moreover, the truth in which this parable reveals is that it is a leased vineyard. With any leased property, it is under temporary ownership. With outlining conditions, if any or all conditions are not met, then the leaser or the leasee must relinquish the property at the owner's discretion. Here is a simple outline of the players and events described in this parable. The certain man is God, and the vineyard is Israel, and the servants are the prophets, the prophets and or John the Baptist and Jesus as the beloved son. And the leases are the religious leaders. In addition, there are the rhetorical question and the result along with the reaction of those the parable is intended to convict. Also, here is a paraphrase of the 
parable of the vineyard as we has read. The story is as follows. A certain man planted a vineyard. He set a fence around it and he dug a wine press in it. And he built a watchtower and leased it to tenants. And says here, while it was time for harvest, he sent a servant to get fruit. But they caught him and beat him. And they struck him in the head and sent him away shamefully. He sent another and they killed him. And many others they beat and some they killed. Finally, he sent his beloved son. They plotted and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard in hope that it would be theirs. What will the owner of the vineyard will do to them? He will come and destroy them all. Then he will give the vineyard to others. Mark chapter 12 verse 11 says that the religious leaders realized that he had told this parable against them. No doubt they remember the writings in Isaiah chapter 5. In Isaiah chapter 5 um, beginning let's see in verse 1 um, it reads um as a story of the beloved of God and it reads in the New English translation he says I will sit I will sing a song to my beloved uh, a song to my lover about his vineyard my love had a vineyard on a fertile hill he built a hedge around it removed its stones and planted a vine he built a tower in the middle of it and constructed a wine press. He waited for it to produce edible grapes, but it produced sour ones instead. So now the residents of Jerusalem, people of Judah, you decide between me and my vineyard. What more can I do for my vineyard beyond what I have already done? When I waited for it to produce edible grapes, why did it produce sour ones instead? Now I will inform you what I am about to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and turn it into pasture. I will break its wall and allow animals to gaze there. I will make it a wasteland. No one will prune its vines or hoe its ground and thorns and briars will grow there. I will order the clouds not to drop any rain on it. Indeed, Israel is the vineyard of the Lord of heaven, and the people of Judah are the cultivated place in which he took delight. He waited for justice, but look what he got, disobedience. He waited for fairness, but look what he got, cries for help. He understand, they understood in Mark chapter 12, verse 12, that Jesus had spoke this parable of the least vineyard against them. I, as a uh, amateur gardener, understands a little bit about gardening. I cut out a small portion in my yard, um, 17 by 21 feet. And I put a uh, cyclone six-foot fence around it. And I uh, constructed gates so I could enter in and could keep out the unwanted animals, like the pesky rabbit and the uh, uh, groundhogs and the other critters that would try to come and destroy uh, my crops when I begin to grow them. And here in Isaiah, he says that he had a vineyard on a fertile hill. And when I began my garden, it was just weeds, stones, and rocks, and thorns in there. So I had to prune all these things back. And that's why I put a fence around it, to keep out all these vines and all these weeds, and also the critters. And he says here in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 2, that he built a hedge around it, just like I built a fence around my garden. He removed his stones and he planted a vine. I planted tomato plants and pepper plants, 
cucumbers that are vine type uh, plants. Um, I planted corn and all these other edible collard greens and kale. Um, as I uh, remember from last crop, I had a lot of critters get in there under the cyclone fence. So this year I had to put an additional fencing around it. I got some chicken wire from Home Depot and I began to attach it to the cyclone fence. I dug a trench around the entire fence and I put the chicken wire about six inches deep and took the remaining dirt that I took from the trench and packed it over the chicken wire. So when the pesky rabbits tried to get through the cyclone fence, they were met by the chicken wire. And the ravishing groundhog, when he began to dig under the cyclone fence, he was met by the chicken wire fence. And he would get frustrated. And I would see many attempts that he made to get into the garden, but he would not succeed. And he would not destroy my crops as he did before. So we see here in verse um, two of Isaiah chapter five, he built a tower in the middle of it. And that was for security purposes where they would have a person in the tower to watch over the crops, watch over the vineyard, and they would uh, be there to um, be on guard against intruders that would try to come in and steal the crops. And he says he constructed a wine press and the wine press is a large hole that was dug in the ground as a vat to get where you would put your grapes in. And if you recall some of those biblical movies in films where you see people stepping in, stepping on the grapes in this large kind of constructed uh, hole in the ground and they would just squeeze the grapes and get all the juice out of it and they would have this release valve where they could uh, extract the juice from the grapes and put them into jars or into vases. And with the old pulp that was left in there after they strained all the juice out of the wine press they would take this pulp and put it back into the garden and that's the same principle that I use I take my when I cut my lawn I bag up all the grass clippings and all the uh, mulch leaves that I have and I'll put it into the garden and let it become um, uh, compost for the next season and during spring I would get out my tiller and then just till all these things together and it would just mend the soil um, this is what you call cultivating the land. And it says here that he planted a vineyard on a fertile hill. He gave them all the essential tools that was needed to succeed. He built a watchtower in the middle of it. He constructed a wine press. And this is what Jesus is telling the religious leaders of Israel. God has given you all the provisions that you need to succeed. Only thing I ask you is that you would produce he says here, he waited for it to produce edible grapes, but it produced sour ones instead. And we know that what the religious leaders were doing was making converts for themselves. They were making people to respect them and they were producing the sour attitude towards God. And they were producing people that were not living up to their commandments or their oath to God. Here Isaiah says that he waited for edible grapes, but it produced sour ones instead. So he says, now the residents of Jerusalem, the people are of Judah. He says, you decide. You decide between me and my vineyard. What more can I have done for my vineyard beyond what I have already done? When I waited for it to produce edible grapes, why did it produce sour ones instead? Now, now I will inform you what I am about to do to my vineyard. I will remove this hedge and turn it into pastures. What he's just saying that the protected fence, just like I put around my garden, if I take that up, if I remove the chicken wire, if I remove the cyclone fence, all the groundhogs will bring in their fellow groundhogs and all the rabbits will bring in their fellow rabbits and they will ravage my garden. They will destroy my crop. They will eat all of my collard greens and all of my hail, kale. 
they will destroy my uh, tomatoes, you know. And this is a sad thing when I come out in the morning and see a groundhog. He just takes a bite out of one of my tomatoes that hasn't even ripe yet. And I'm saying, look, you just wasted my fruit. You just caused my efforts to be fruitful. He says, and this is what God is saying. I will break. I will break his wall. I will allow animals to gaze there. I will make it a wasteland. And no one, he says, no one will prune his vines. No one will hold his ground. And no one will remove the thorns and the briars that will grow there. He's selling, he's telling Israel, I'm going to let you go back into the land and be a wasteland. I'm going to let you to be a dry, non-fertile land. He says, I will order the clouds not to drop any rain on it. Indeed, in verse 7 of Isaiah chapter 5, he says, Israel is the vineyard. Israel is the vineyard of the Lord of heaven. He says, the people are Judah. They are a cultivated place in which he took, notice the past tense, he took delight in. He waited for justice, but look what he got instead. He got disobedience. He says he waited for fairness, but look what he got instead. He got cries for help from the needy and the poor. In Mark's gospel, chapter 12, verse 12, the religious leaders understood. They understood what Mark was saying, what Jesus was saying to them. He says here, he says in verse 11, well, in verse, let me look at it. He says, finally, in verse 6, finally I sent my, my only one son that they might respect. And he says, look, they seen that he was the heir. And they said, let's kill him and take the inheritance and it will be ours. So they seized Jesus and they killed him and they threw his body outside of Jerusalem. He says in verse 9 of Mark chapter 12, God says, what then? What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come. He will come and destroy those tenants. And he will give the vineyard to others. And that is us, the Gentiles. He has now given the vineyard to us. Paul said in Romans chapter 5. Let me see if I can find that verse. Romans chapter 5. I'll just stop it. Verse 10. Uh, let's see. Bear with me for one moment. In Romans chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Not only this, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, whom we have now received this reconciliation. He says here that God has given the vineyard over to others. He says here that God has ordained the Gentiles to come in. If you look at Romans chapter 11, and you will see how the Gentiles was grafted in. It says that, he says that somehow I could provoke my people to jealousy to save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will be their acceptance? But life from the dead. If first the portion of the dough offered is holy, then the whole batch is holy. And if the root is holy, so too are the branches. Now, if some of the branches were broken off, that's us. And you, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among them and participated in the richness of the olive root. Do not boast over the branches, but if you boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Then you will say the branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, they were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, 
perhaps he will not spare you. Notice, notice therefore the kindness and harshness of God, harshness towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness towards you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise you also will be cut off and even, even they, if they do not continue in, their unbelief will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more, how much more will these natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree? For I do not, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mysteries, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. A partial hardening has happened to Israel until the full. Here it is. He says he will give the vineyard to others. Who are the others? Paul says until the fullness of the number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all so Israel will be saved. It is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. I'm telling you, the vineyard of the least vineyard of the, the, the unfaithful tenants. This parable has been thrown alongside of the previous episode of the religious leaders question of Jesus' authority to do these things in the temple. Just as the owner of the vineyard had authority to evict the tenants, likewise Jesus had the authority in the temple. In other words, in other words, he said to them, I am the God, I am the God of the temple. And just like he was the owner of the vineyard, furthermore, Furthermore, God's judgment has come against the house of Israel. The withered fig tree was an example to the disciples that God will judge the religious leaders and their false religious system. He says now the, the parable is a clear example to the false religious system and to its leaders. In 70 AD, the Roman emperor, Titus Flavius Sabius Vespasian was called from the siege of Jerusalem to assume the imperial power of Rome, leaving his son Titus, leaving Titus Vespasian in charge of the Jewish war, recorded in the Zondervan Pictorial Encyclopedia of the Bible, Volume 5. Page 877, you see as I am concluding this main point, is history bears record of the fulfillment of God's prophecy. It is a warning to us that we are tenants to the things God having entrusted with us. And if we fail, if we fail to do what is required of us, then we can face we can face similar outcomes as the withered fig tree, just as well as those to whom the parable of the least vineyard was intended for. I am your host, LT. This has been your manner moment, a least vineyard, a least vineyard that God expects us to bring forth right fruit, edible fruit. Those converts that are fit for the master's use. May God bless you. May he continue to have his face shine upon you. Until next time we meet, I am your host, LT, signing off with an amen and amen. Thank you for listening to our message today. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. 
We thank you for listening to us today. And may this blessing be upon you. We thank you once again, Fresh Manna Ministries, Fresh Manna Midweek Moments.